All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Hello and welcome to our first of the ASH 2020 presidential webinars. The series of six webinars has been curated by our moderator today, ASH 2020 President Carrie Ann O'Mara, to share research and best practices around higher education areas most impacted by COVID-19, with a particular focus on equity for students, faculty, and staff. This webinar is being live captioned, and those captions can be accessed by clicking the CC button in your menu bar. The webinar is also being recorded and will be available on the ASH website in the next week. Throughout the webinar, you can pose questions to the panelists by using the Q&A feature in the menu bar. They may answer questions throughout or at the end. Today's webinar is titled, What is at Stake? The View from Academic Leaders. We are so thankful for today's panelists. Dr. Lori Patton Davis, who joins us from the traditional homelands of the Shawnee, Mia Amia, and Hopewell peoples. Dr. Ana Martinez Alamo, who joins us from the, from the traditional homelands of the Paul Tucket and Massachusetts people. Dr. Jose Luis Riera, who joins us from th the traditional homelands of the Lenny Lenape people and Dr. Carrie Ann O'Mara, who joins us from the traditional homelands of the Nukuchtank and Piscataway peoples. I introduce each of our panelists today, along with the naming of the people whose unceded land they are joining us from. I also encourage all of today's attendees from throughout the country and the world to learn and reflect on the history and contemporary place where you join us from. I would also like to recognize that I am joining everyone today from Las Vegas, which is the traditional homeland of the Southern Paiute peoples. Without further ado, I will turn it over today to today's moderator, Dr. Carrie Ann O'Mara. Hello, Ash colleagues. It's so, gr it's so great to have so many of you join us for this webinar. We're really excited to lift off with this series. So the premise of this webinar today is that we're not only facing a global pandemic and all the fallout from it, but we're also facing a sort of existential crisis uh, in higher education. We're in um, whether we want the change or not, um, many second order changes are being suggested, as Larry Cuban might say. Um, and we have ASH members at the forefront of making those decisions and informing those decisions, whether policy making or in departments, in dean's offices and provosts and student affairs offices. They're watching as these little, small, medium decisions are made. Um, and we wanna particularly find out what they're seeing from these unique perches. And because equity is a, a critical value of, of ASH and of the scholarship, I would say, of most of our members, um, we also wanna ask them what they're most worried about, what, where we need more research to understand the disproportionate effect that the global pandemic and COVID has caused um, nationally. And I wanna give us a few statistics before we turn to the panel, just briefly. So the Strata Research Center has observed um, that two out of three young adults ages 18 to 24 have changed or canceled their graduation, excuse me, their education plans. So that means that they've delayed enrollment, they've reduced the number of courses they'll take, they've changed whether they'll go at all, um, or they've changed where they're gonna go. Now, th that's a pretty sizable number from a survey that they did. Um, it also showed though, and, and importantly, that these changes have disproportionately affected uh, some groups of students over, over others. So for example, 50% of the Latinos and 40% of Black Americans have changed or canceled education plans versus about 26% of white Americans in that survey. And as many of you who follow Inside Higher Ed and the Chronicle would have seen this morning, the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center just came out showing that while there might be flat enrollment overall and a slight uptick in graduate enrollment, um, there have been important declines and mostly uh, the largest group that's been vulnerable to declines um, in enrollment are um, black undergraduates attending community colleges and for-profit institutions. Secondly, the financial fallout from the pandemic is estimated already to have included over 50,000 layoffs and furloughs thus far. Um, UMass Amherst, for example, just announced 850 employees, including many dining hall and residence hall staff. Um, there's hiring freezes, um, there's reductions in salary, uh, and we're expecting cuts almost everywhere. 
But we do also have to look hard at the fact who workers who most often um, make the least within our institutions are, have been the most vulnerable to cuts um, and to furloughs. There are disproportionate effects on our employees. And then the chaos we're in, do we open? How do we open? Um, how do we do it safely? When do we close? How do we be transparent about those decisions? Um, have revealed tensions that we have between faculty and administrators, between students and faculty, um, between unions um, and, and administrators, um, and also with parents who are asking whether or not there should be a discount on their now mostly online um, uh, edu college education. So in transitioning to the panel, I wanna raise one other really important issue and um, use a line um, shared by our college at the University of Maryland, um, University of Maryland president, uh, uh, Daryl Pines, who's also observed that we're not only fighting a, a global pandemic, of course, but we're fighting twin pandemics of the virus and racial justice. So we are realizing now a long overdue need to reckon with systemic racism, and yet calls to do so are frustrated by campuses who aren't exactly sure what to do, um, maybe not listening to the folks who have a sense of what we need to do, and, are all, and many student activists are feeling frustrated um, by the constraints of COVID and whether or not their campuses has come back in ways in which they can have ways. Okay, <laughs> I wish I had, I had a longer list of, uh, of, of some positive things to, to set us up. But I mean, this is how our folks are spending their day is, is struggling with some really important issues. So having set that background, I wanna to turn to our panel and ask Lori the first question that'll be followed um, by our other panelists. So Lori, as department chair, um, I'd love you to tell us what you're spending your day doing, um, the kinds of decisions you're confronting, and if you have any particular concerns about equity in, in some of these areas, share, if you could share a little bit of that with us. Okay. Um, thanks, Carrie Ann. Um, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head when you talked about everything going on with the pandemic. So I, I uh, can't imagine meeting uh, an administrator who isn't thinking about how we manage uh, uh, in uh, COVID-19. Uh, and so that's sort of an ever-present thing right now. And what it's done is revealed issues around how we budget it um enrollments uh and there are a lot of just huge gray areas around how we manage you know students being on campus the desire to have a traditional uh, college experience but there's no safety in it <laughs> um, because it involves gathering um and i would say the the main thing so all of these things are across the landscape the budget the enrollment all of these pieces are taking place but to me the thing that sort of keeps me up at night and keeps me wondering is how to shift mindsets because we have a particular way of thinking about how our institutions work um, and uh, they're not working you know the way that we think they're supposed to work so for example um, I'm trying to figure out how do I get um, faculty to understand that enrollments really really matter like we need people to teach but that's hard to shift a mindset that says no grants that's that's what brings in the money but grants you know they, they're not solid enough to to maintain like a a, the, a, a department um uh, so, I mean, there are those pieces. Um, I think also, um, you know, research versus teaching, like, you know, faculty who they don't want to um, increase the number of students in their class because they don't want to hurt quality. But again, in graduate school, you know, uh, where the belief is, you know, as a graduate student, you shouldn't have to pay to go through. We need enrollments, right? How, how can we support uh, how can we support a system um, like this, right? So I think that is uh, a major issue for me. Um, and, you know, the other piece is the pandemic. So you mentioned twin pandemics. I'm going to go ahead and say racial inequity is probably like the older, oldest sibling. Um, uh, and so uh, that is all, you know, within the backdrop too. So every decision you know, we're making about the budgets and, you know, who gets access and all of these other pieces are shaped by, 
you know, uh, racism and, you know, who has the money and who has the access and, you know, um, should we uh, require testing? You know, should we still be doing the GRE when we know it's prohibitive, right? Um, it doesn't tell us much, but there's also these questions around rankings, but they're rooted in, I think, some racist ideologies that um, certainly make it more difficult uh, to, to push decisions forward between, again, traditional ways of seeing how our institutions operate and the present context that's really forcing us to rethink a lot of it. Thank you, Lori. Yeah, good point. Older uh, twins are usually only six minutes apart, and this is like, deck, you know, <laughs> eons. eons. Uh, Anna, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, you know, I have to say that I, I have been spending most of my time uh, since March in one way or another trying to unravel the ethics of implementing teaching, research, and service in this kind of pandemic state that we're in. Because um, it requires you to recognize both the macro and the micro view that, you, that is required for decision making to then be able to be an, an equity-minded decision, right? Um, because you do have to think about the whole, the larger view, the future view, how it affects groups of people, how it affects then individuals um, across, and in partic my particular case, a faculty, right? In addition to staff uh, and students. So that the decisions that we made in March um, right away gave me a, a sense that I had to really think through the nature of decision making now, right? Which is that these are tentative uh, exercises in contingency planning, which don't usually engender trust in faculty, staff, and students, or anyone for that matter, right? Because you want decisions to be definitive. But the nature of the virus, COVID planning, et cetera, requires all decisions to be somewhat tentative and that's a little unnerving. Um, so that planning, planning and managing the fall instructional modalities and developing and managing remote instruction and faculty skill set development, faculty stress around that, um, and how then that also meant hybrid instruction and on campus student instruction in our case, because we brought all the students back, um, and then how that then disrupts their research agenda or derails it across all levels of faculty. Um, and then how that then folds over onto you know, our staff and our staff, for example, who are dealing with teacher practicum placements when K-12 is you know, very disrupted. Um, and then you know, the reality that the pandemic and our reactions to it aren't the only things that we do, that all of the non-COVID related stuff that was there before, our plans around faculty development and equity and inclusion, curricular changes around equity, enrollment issues and equity issues, planning for retirements, what are we gonna do about new hires, pending budget restrictions, all that is still there. So you, open up your inbox, or I'll open up my inbox very early in the morning, and it, it is an active volcano, and then you have to just keep at it. Thanks, Anna. Um, Jose Luis? Yeah, so um, I, as a, you know, obviously Vice President for Student Life and, and really thinking about student affairs, I think um, a, a number of things come to mind. The first is just competing priorities. I mean, since since March when this hit, um, it's 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 trying to prioritize priorities that are very difficult to to, to try to stack one over another. Um, I think I, I'm not sure I've ever been involved in a period of time where so much new policy has been written on the institutional level and and writing it in a way that I would say are living policies. So policies that don't commit the institution really to anything for the long term. Um, but to, to, to Anna's point, as, as long as, because everything is so tentative, as long as we then have some new insight about something and then can revise it because we are now shifting and doing something else. And that, that, that seems to be, um, uh, the, the, the way that things have gone. I think for me, what characterizes 
uh, responding to these pandemics that you've talked about um, differently than other crises in the past is one, obviously, the, the, how it's endured time. And, and, and Lori's point is well taken. I, I think the, the racial inequities obviously have been here. Uh, COVID, as many have noted, uh, have, have obviously highlighted or illuminated those in new ways. Um, but, but I think the having to serve all constituents across campus and, and within each of those constituencies, try to figure out what gets prioritized when I think about from, from an equity standpoint. So I'll give you some examples. Like undergrad students, uh, one of the waves, I would say, two or three months ago in student affairs is deciding who might be invited to come to campus. So is it first year students? Is it senior students? Well, how about sophomores? We, we know there's a, a whole body of research around what happens in the sophomore year. Um, is it uh, students who are out of state? For me as a flagship institution, is it students that are in state? Uh, is it students that we would label as those being academically at risk or maybe at risk from a well-being perspective or at risk from a financial perspective? Um, you know, home and food insecurity. You know, grad students. Who gets access to be on campus? Is it STEM grad students because they need labs? Well, what about humanities and social sciences? Uh, the ability to access the library where they do research. Um, who's close to degree and relies on a grant from the NSF or NIH that um, is going to time out? And so in order for them to get through, uh, how about employees? I mean, the whole idea of who's essential and who's not essential. And in the midst of that, I know we asked ourselves as a as a senior administration at Delaware, are those even the right terms? Are those the, the terms that we really should be using in our communications um, to talk about our staff? So, so I think though the, the, but both the breadth of the constituencies that, that, that we have to think about in responding, but then also the depth um, in each of those, as you think about you know, trying to make these decisions as an equity-minded, um, uh, in, in informed lens, I think has caused quite a bit of challenge. Can I ask you, because you're actually next up on the next question, <laughs> we'll jump right in. Um, in any of those situations that you described or other important decisions that Delaware's had to make, as you've watched your, your colleagues probably at a cabinet level have to make really tough decisions as you've had to make them, is higher ed research in there anywhere? <laughs> like, you know, it's hard because I don't think anybody probably did a study on whether or not, um, you know, uh, the person who was on a grant should get preference over the humanities person when we have COVID, because how could we have right, um, done that? But we certainly have research that, that, that might inform some of the decisions that, that you just, um, but there's always been a research practice divide of, of, you know, does our research get into the hands of folks that can use it in a timely way in bite sizes that's useful? So have right. you seen any, any research inform any of these decisions, or or was there work you wish had informed decisions, or doesn't even exist yet, that that um, our colleagues might create or support? Yeah. yeah so I I I mean I think in terms of um, I guess I I would think about it on a couple levels. I, I definitely think campus based assessment and the development that has happened um, in the last you know decade decade and a half around around assessment and the need to be doing assessment. Um, has positioned us well in, in the sense that we were really able to go out to students with some, some great platforms and um, uh, assessment tools in the spring to learn what worked, what didn't, what did you resonate with. Um, and I do think that very much informed in real time uh, the way our provost office then uh, went out and thought about how to train more faculty to really, to, to not what, what, what I say is what we did in the spring is we put a bunch of classes on Zoom um, and, and versus I think we shifted this semester to really developing uh, much more evidence practice based online education, you, you know, strategies, pedagogical strategies. So, so, so I think that the, the, both the campus based assessment and then um, the, the, the research body around online education and learning definitely I, I, I have seen used. Um, I think on an administrative level, as we continue to be pushed around budget constraints, and, and we obviously have seen some institutions making personnel reductions, and I think more will definitely come in, in, in the next 
few weeks, um, you know, I think the bodies around, which aren't necessarily higher ed specific, but we've adopted many of them and certainly contribute to them, organizational change, organizational behavior, thinking about how we should be thinking about change, change management theory. I definitely think that's, that's, that's been used. It was probably easiest for me to be honest to think about the places we're not using research where we should be. And, 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 and what I would say is it, it's in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space, right? So, so I think Lori said it really well. Um, uh, I think it was Lori. It might have been you, Carrie. I'm not, now I don't remember. But it was, it, it's, it's, it's this idea of, you know, so many of our campuses don't really know what to do about that. We, we don't know how to approach that. And, and I, I just don't think we're really consuming the research, at, at least I, I, broadly as a senior administrative team, when I think of presidents, cabinets across the country, I'm not sure. Um, somehow, we continue to believe that diversity is guided by personal philosophy and thought, and, and, and we're not looking to the research first to see what does the research tell us because I, I think the research is really clear and helps to guide us because it, it, it presents a complexity of this. You can't just look at numbers, you know, compositional diversity. You need to look at legacy. You need to look at symbolism on your campus. You need to look at culture and climate. I mean, all these things integrate. Um, and I just don't think we're, we're, we're there yet, at least as a profession where we're really using that research to inform our practices in that area. Thank you. And that's probably a good segue to some thoughts Lori might have uh, to answer that question. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, I think, uh, you know, I often just kind of wonder, like the urgency around COVID-19, it, it was swift, right? And I wonder what might that urgency have looked like around racial justice, you know? Um, but I will say there, you know, at least based upon what occurred, you know, over the summer, um, you saw more statements um, made by our institutions related to uh, racial inequities, um, which I think was uh, an important shift. Um, I just don't want institutions to stop there, um, which I think is what happens. And so I appreciate the statements because they become public and a form of accountability um, for people on campus to say, well, you in, in March, you know, you said these things, you know, so where's the action behind that? Um, so I do see some more action, but I don't see a lot of um, um, higher ed research being used the way that I, you know, had hoped that it would be. Um, I've seen work from um, uh, Ibram Kendi, I, I think, on how to be an anti-racist and, you know, Robin D'Angelo, uh, um, who are not technically, you know, within higher ed. Um, and so I do see the work of scholars being used. They're just not within our particular field. Um, I'll say from my own standpoint, when I'm thinking about decisions, I can always either, you know, go back or, or pull up particular things that I've read that have been helpful to me. So um, in, Inside Higher Ed published a piece by uh, D.L. Stewart about the language of appeasement, right? And so I've kind of used that to really kind of check when, when I'm making a statement or communicating, am I talking about diversity or am I really communicating about equity? And so that has helped to inform how I've, you know, communicated and made some decisions. But I also think um, uh, uh, Estella Ben Simone's work on practitioner knowledge. So that's been really critical. Um, when when uh, the dean's executive cabinet meets, you know, we have people who are actually like school superintendents sort of, you know, coming into our, you know, meeting space and talking about what the schools are dealing with and, you know, how the college can be a good partner uh, in education around, you know, COVID-19 and uh, racial justice. So I, I think it's more of a, it's an indirect influence um, where, where I've seen it. And then just from my own understanding of the research, but I don't, even when I read Inside Higher Ed and the Chronicle, I don't always see scholarship by our colleagues being um, featured. And I, I, I don't know what that is about. Um, or maybe it says something about our need to expand how we, you know, promote the work or whatever. Um, but I do see some value in, in the scholarship that we produce as a field, I just don't see it being tapped into um, 
uh, as much as other fields. So scholars who are in other fields, but their work sort of uh, um, is in within the higher ed context. Thank you. Anna, do you want to add? Um, yeah, I mean, I have to just dis disclaimer here that this is a particular burr in my saddle and it has been throughout my professional career and the list was rather long. So I'm just going to touch on three things. <laughs> um, and in some, I mean, the answer is it's largely absent, right? And I think that's what we've all been saying. Um, you know, top level decision making, especially during this time, it's become very, very evident. Like you can't miss the fact that just in, I'll just, just give you two examples. Um, they've clearly missed the memo on equity and inclusion, and there's enough science data on that, social science data on that, and also on college student development in designing their reopening plans. Like, I don't know, 18 to 22 year olds, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of research on how they're going to behave, but yet we somehow, our decision making is blind to that research. Um, the issue um, around decision making and planning and the absence of or let me put it, let me flip it. Uh, when you have top down decision making uh, and around academic management, certainly breeds distrust, resentment, resistance, and lots of redundant work that then further intensifies distrust and resentment. And there's a lot of very good scholarship on that among our colleagues who do that kind of assessing of the relationship between decision makers at institutions and faculty, et cetera. And then, uh, this is last, and then I'll, I'll stop for a second. Um, you know, the disproportionate impact of COVID decisions, um, uh, of the decisions that we have made around COVID planning, I guess is the best way of putting it, on women on campus in particular, and that means women of color, et cetera, everything from bathrooms to less flexibility or the, the sort of blindness to the real complexities of working from home um, that are especially problematic for many women with young children who are caretakers of other family members, et cetera, um, has just absolutely been stunning, absolutely stunning to me. Um, and again, there's lots of great research on that. Thank you. Before we go on to the silver linings question, I, I wanted to just share quickly um, something that I is a little uh, go Buckeyes moment, Lori. <laughs> I have this distinct memory, which would have been several decades ago, um, of being in a class, I think, believe it would have been Marianne um, uh, Segaria Danowitz's class, wherein she um, was talking about Judith Hackman's work on uh, the, the degree to which budget cuts could be tracked based on the power that the unit had within the organization versus the, so the degree to which it was considered central to the, the core mission of the institution and, and some interaction between that and the external prestige or resources that it was bringing in from the outside, right? Mm -hmm. And it occurs to me that research like that that can follow past budget cuts and, and that could help us from an equity lens examine, okay, what's about to be cut? And, and let's think about why. I mean, there's the obvious answers, which are, well, those employees can't work here anymore for a variety, you know. But then it, there's other pieces. Like, are those also the, the least, do they have the least powerful voice in terms of at the table of decision making, such that there might have been a different way to do those layoffs that would have been, you know. Or um, why, why are we considering this unit to be more central to us? Is that the same answer 20 years later, you know? physics versus philosophy mm -hmm. versus black studies versus. And so those kinds of those kinds of theories that we do have richly that our scholars have drawn on to sort of make sense of practically what's happening. Um, Peter Eckel did some great work on that years ago uh, to follow what people cut and why and the process by which that happened. I think we're gonna need that over the next six months because um, as Jose said, it's, um, it, it seems like the cuts are coming as I write to folks, uh, you know, about various various things, including donations, I get a lot of emails back saying, "What are you asking me for? Are you kidding? My my place just got this and that and the other thing." Um, and so it's just a reality. But but being able to study those cuts preventatively from an equity lens is going to be so important for our leaders. I think. Um, all right, now turning to silver linings, we didn't want to only talk about uh, the challenges, but also. 
Um, I think Lori mentioned before the GRE um, and the SAT and other, you know, prestige and, and biased ways we've done admissions. And many campuses are rethinking those or have completely gotten rid of them. Are there any silver linings in your view, uh, recognizing, of course, we wouldn't have brought COVID on, but are there any ways in which your institutions have rethought some structure or practice that might not have been equitable and is now potentially going to change or people are seeing differently because of the circumstances we're in? I'm leading off, Carrie, is that it? Yes, yes I know what I was Okay, okay. that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, I guess um, two caveats. One is that I am dispositionally glass half full. So that's always good. And then the other caveat is that um, the other half of the glass still exists. So this is probably that question as well. Because <laughs> I'm not yet fully convinced that very much of what we do has been rethought for the long haul. Mm -hmm. Right. I think we we are in many cases across many institutions, across many function areas. Um, uh, you know, I, I think we're react rightly so, mind you. You know, like we're in reactionary moments and in survival mode because yeah, we have to do that. Um, so you know, many of us are pivoting to respond to COVID challenges, but it's not yet clear to me that we. Will, that we won't just pivot back to business as usual when this is over. So the GR and the SAT are obvious, you know, in many ways. Um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's like, you know, uh, the baseball metaphor being that the pitcher throws a wild pitch and you get to score a free run. It's like, hey, you know, um, the lack of availability, the accessibility of testing sites worldwide have given institutions, you know, the opportunity and license to either pilot admissions um, processes uh, and persistence correlations more holistically, right? That now it, it now plays into that hand, so to speak. Um, and, you know, let's think of it as a good thing that it could maybe positively affect access for marginalized student groups and consequently enable us to act more equitably at admissions. The downside, of course, is that, and this is where I, I throw out the cautionary um, moment here, uh, many international students will be negatively affected by the absence of, and other graduate students in certain lic licensure programs, for example, will have to find a way to take the GRE given accreditation requirements um, by certain professional organizations. So the APA mandates it for many of its uh, PhD programs, for example. So, you know, those populations may get the bad side of that decision. The other issue that I think is, is certainly something that we have to d think about and very seriously is that though in theory, the absence of high stakes testing like the GRE, SAT, et cetera, should enable more thorough and equitable access or equitable assessment, let's say, of candidate credentials, the risk is that admissions officers and faculty will default to biased normative standards of excellence. You know, institutional pedigree, where did that person get their degree? Um, or, you know, which uh, another flare that many of us have, have thrown up this year is that, you know, AP exam scores as the proxy for quality, well, you'd be forgetting that not all IP course instruction nationwide is equal and that COVID disadvantaged those schools that pushed AP instruction and content closer to the test date uh, in the spring semester. So to really say that it is a silver bullet getting rid of the GRE and the SAT, yes, it's good in many ways, but we have to be conscious of what then it brings to the table and the work that's required to actually, you know, make good on that great opportunity if that's what, you know, if you want equity and access. On the plus side, I think instruction, um, gosh, undergraduate and graduate, moving to remote or hybrid environments has given faculty the opportunity to be much more thoughtful about curricular and learning outcomes, modes of assessment, modes of student participation, advising students, um, having to change practices from what you know, had been habituated over a professional lifetime. And we all know that because we've all done it and continue to do it. 
It has in many, many cases, retrained faculty to be much more deliberate about pedagogy, to be thinking about pedagogy, which is a big step oftentimes across all disciplines in the university. Uh, and again, we'll see if that lasts as well. If when we, we go back to primarily in person, will there be that move from the virtual or hybrid space where we, you know, we did learning outcomes because you, you kind of sort of have to in the online space. Are we actually going to move those over to in person? Um, and I think that's, for me, the long range view of COVID as an academic administrator is in fact thinking about, well, okay, you know, what good did come out of this that shouldn't go away just because, you know, it shouldn't be vaccinated away. How's that? That's a, that's a subtitle for a paper for sure. <laughs> vaccinated <laughs> away. You just, much more interesting paper than our typical colon, blah, 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 blah. Right. Um, but I, I really, I just want to respond that I really uh, appreciate the point. I, I do a lot of reading in um, implicit bias studies and people's attempted fixes at things. And in the area, I, I'm just thinking as you were talking about the shift away from GRE and SAT, especially institutions that get large numbers of applicants, and now admissions offices have to re recreate a fair system. Um, Mike Bastido, I know, has done some great work in trying to make sure that um, admissions officers understand holistically where students came from beyond pedigree, like that mm -hmm. it's a holistic sure. understanding. Exactly. Exactly. And that's some promising mm -hmm. work. But there was this, this one study I'm thinking of that makes your point in a completely different area. They, there was a, a movement to get rid of the box that folks who had spent some time in prison had to. Um, that's right. Yeah. And unfortunately, although you, of course you want to get rid of that so that folks have a chance at a job, they found that when they got rid of it, that many of the employers then superimpose their expectation about whether or not this person had been in prison. And they did it worse if you were mm -hmm. um, a black employee than a white employee, but they did it for both groups and chances sure. of getting jobs got worse. So that doesn't mean put the box back, but it means their solution, which in our case is get rid of the GR, you know, for some people might be reduce uh, use of GRE, SAT, those solutions will have to be tested and, you know, we'll have to make sure that there's not a new equity problem we create. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I hardly, I mean, the equivalent, you know, as instructors, as faculty, or as teaching faculty, the equivalent is now when I have to really sit down and say to myself, okay, so what does it really mean to give an A? What does it really mean to give a B, right? So I really have to think about, well, what does it mean to say that this, particular applicant has, you know, the academic preparation and has shown uh, expertise in or has experience in, like, what does that really mean? And then what biases do I have around what, what you know, how it is that meaning is made, right? And that's tough. And, you know, your point, it's a little bit easier, may I say, in small, at, at small institutions with smaller numbers, of applicants and many of these institutions are far more uh, financially stable or they're just private institutions with a good endowment so they have enough staff to engage in that kind of assessment. But in the larger publics with you know uh, significantly more applications, fewer staff members, dwindling budgets, that's a tough lift. That's gonna be a tough lift. All right, I want to turn to um, Jose, can you, would you go next on this question of whether or not, I think we were talking about silver linings, <laughs> sure. as well yeah. as challenges they bring. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I do, I think, um, not to dwell on this too long, but I think the SAT in particular for undergrad, it's going to be interesting. It's really going to affect enrollment strategies. I mean, the College Board provides names to all of our institutions, I mean, we buy them, but um, that, that help us to start recruiting students. So, so that's the other side of this, which is gonna be very interesting to see how enrollment management um, adapts to ways that they even begin to reach out to students and who do they reach out to? And because there's a bias there already, right? Who's taken the test and who's scored X um, on, on the test? And that's, that's a starting point. Um, anyway, was, one of my immediate thoughts Carrie Ann was, this would be a really interesting question to ask uh, deeper into this fall semester, because to Anna's point earlier, 
I think we all fell victim to some extent of kind of magical thinking around one, how our college students would behave when they return, and two, um, the fact that this virus by spring semester will rebound and will be in a good place. And I think as the weeks go on, at least my sense among my colleagues that I've connected with at other institutions is we're talking about a full fiscal year of impact. Um, and, and, and then there's going to be certainly leftover from that actively as we move into next year's fiscal year. Um, you, you know, I think some of the things that will never go back on um, or that have taught us things already that I've picked up on are likely the delivery of some of our one-to-one -one services. So um, what I'm hearing from academic advisors is that uh, they feel like uh, they've gained some really effective ways of being able to meet with a student virtually, um, in many ways sharing a screen, um, being able to, to, to walk them through, click them through, this is how you find your class schedule, this is where you go, here's a degree audit, Here, here's how you can track your academic um, progress, all of those types of things are potentially facilitated. And then the other area around that um, is this general field of counseling. So uh, career readiness, career counseling, um, which at Delaware we had already started that virtually prior to this, um, but then also I really think about psychology and psychiatry. I mean, the, the if, if we're able to advocate and get some permanent changes around telehealth and the ability of psych, you know, licensed psychologists and psychiatrists to do that work across state lines in a telehealth environment. Um, I mean, it's totally changed access for us in terms of who gets access to the counseling center. Um, you know, we and and I think other flagships in 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 probably much larger numbers, but we have three satellite campus locations, but our counseling center sits on our main campus. Um, and, and the reality is those satellite locations, in fact, we don't even charge them the health fee because it's not realistic. They, they can opt into that if they're able to come to the main campus. Uh, this gives us a real opportunity to serve those students and who's typically on our satellite campuses, lower income, disproportionately black, black and brown students who absolutely need that type of support. Um, and then, and then one other thing I was going to say is I, I do, and, and Lori references with the with um, the announcements we've seen coming out. Uh, I do think, uh, and and I certainly hope the momentum continues. You, you know, equity as much as we've talked about it in the past, and it's a priority, um, is one of those things that shelved when crisis comes along. We it, it just feels different. Um, the, the, there's a sense that. We can't put that to the side. We have to wrestle with it as hard as it is in dealing with this other real pandemic of, of this public health pandemic. We still got to figure out something around this equity thing. And so I, I think it's interesting. It's in the mix in a way I haven't necessarily seen it. I think senior administration is feeling that pressure. I think students not being on campus has forced them to mobilize on social media in ways that they likely wouldn't have done. And in some ways I think is more effective. I think it exposes our institutions to more people. Um, I mean, if you have a protest on campus, yeah, you can occupy a building and your regional news picks it up. Um, but beyond that, whereas it's social media, your prospective students are looking at it, your prospective parents, your prospective families, um, it changes the game, I think, of, of how senior administrators need to pay attention to these issues. Great examples. Laura, do you want to? Yeah, um, I think uh, one of the silver linings has been the, the online teaching. Um, and I, you know, distinctly recall in the past, you know, certain faculty being, you know, adamant against it, right? Um, and now uh, I, I've heard, you know, people talk about, oh, it's not as bad as I thought, or, you know, it, this can be a quality learning experience. Um, and so that's been positive. I think the other positive piece um, is just that in many ways, change was imminent. It, you know, it was going to happen anyway, uh, but I think um, with COVID and, uh, you know, the racial injustices, it sort of helped to expedite it. Um, and uh, it doesn't require, I guess, from a leadership standpoint to do a whole lot of convincing, you know, that uh, the change needs to happen um, because those pieces are there. Um, 
I do see some opportunities. Um, I mean, I haven't done them yet. I've thought about them, but I wonder when I think about uh, the, the trainings that are mandatory for sexual harassment, what would it mean to have mandatory training around um, you know, race and racism on campus. Um, and so I think there's an opportunity there because there are, uh, as uh, uh, Jose Luis mentioned, there is an interest now um, that looks or, or feels a little different from the past um, to do that. Um, and to uh, Anna's point earlier, I, I think we were talking about the grades, like, you know, how do you determine what's an A uh, and how do you grade? And I'm teaching a graduate level pro seminar class with doctoral students. There are 81 students in there. And one of the realities that I've been grappling with that I think, you know, s sort of um, may represent a silver lining um, is not relying on grades. Um, like, I, I, I'm just toying with it in my head around how do I not focus heavily on the grade, but focus on the experience, understanding that, and, and I'm saying this at the doctoral level, you come to get this credential for a reason, right? You can either participate in it or not, um, but as an instructor, I'm gonna give you everything that I have. Uh, and so, um, and I don't know that a grade, you know, helps to, um, you know, get them closer to the degree, uh, to the degree, but more about the experience. And so in terms of faculty and, you know, uh, other instructors being more thoughtful about content and um, how that content resonates with students, um, rather than the grade piece, I think, um, uh, is one potential silver lining. Um, it's potential there. <laughs> Thank you. And you know, um, as we were talking before about uh, all the different decisions that were going on, I was thinking what it would feel like to be a graduate student right now, um, thinking about research agendas, right? So on the one hand, a lot of our graduate students um, in our programs had their research, if it was already determined, um, grad significantly shifted. I mean, they, they either had to be on pause if it was face-to-face -face interviews or frozen for a while, or they needed to go online for some reason. But then there's folks who you know, could partner with student affairs, for example, or a dean's office or the provost's office and actually study some of these problems that people need data on and try to understand whether this thing you do, you know, we have best practices in, in um, high impact practice research. What, what you know, to contribute to that body of work on, uh, you know, Zoom, best practices, but, but you know, more than that, obviously, um, or, you know, what's happening with faculty and, um, you know, care at home and what's happening with employees, um, even just following the money. So there was a question in the chat um, that um, probably as a VP for student affairs, Jose, you're the best to, <laughs> to address, which is people were saying, okay, people are talking about all these furloughs. Are institutions really grappling with whether or not to use their reserves? So places like Maryland and Delaware probably don't have as many reserves as places like Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. Um, or, you know, but uh, I, I think that's a reasonable question. It's an equity oriented question. If you're not going to use reserves for the worst of times like this, then what are they for? And yet there's also financial stability and reasons you have to keep that money there. So have you heard any conversations about drawing on, on reserves or resources or endowments to make up so that the, the effect of the, the cuts uh, could be lessened somewhat or I don't know, through fundraising? I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, th I think all of those conversations are really active. And, um, you know, I think reserves, when I think of reserves on a unit level or a college level or, you know, an administrative unit level, um, I, I think one of the conflicts there is, yes, reserves can be drawn on, but there's also a reality that spending needs to be decreased immediately. So reserves doesn't do anything for spending. It's just spending out of a different pot. Um, and depending on how, wh where your institution is in terms of 
um, you know, an institution, every institution is carrying debt and that debt is rated by Moody's and, and absolutely your reserves are a key part of that formula. Yep. And so, so I think institutions are weighing those decisions. Um, but, but I also think there is a reality about cash on hand for an institution. And, 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 and so one of the strategies to maintain cash on hand is you just reduce spending. Um, endowments, I think, are, are always, you know, a debate and, and it'll be interesting. I'm not sure if this will change that thinking. Um, obviously, some of endowments are earmarked by donors to be used for a certain reason. Most institutions legally reserve the right to, to redirect that money, but I, it would really, I think, need to be quite a crisis for an institution to, to do that. Um, and, and, and I'm not sure, at least I'll say larger institutions are, are at that point. Now, I think some of those smaller colleges that were already talking about bankruptcy, or I, I mean, absolutely, I, I think they would be at that point. Um, but that's, that's one of those equity questions, right? Is, is, yeah. is how do you think about who you retain during this time, who you don't retain? Um, and, and the reality is our service driven areas where there's activity level reduced, I mean, those are often the areas that we're going to, to say we need to reduce personnel or expense in that area. And, and yet it might be an area that's really critical to student success or student development. So it's, it's obviously right. complex, right. but those are some. Yeah. Of I mean, I, you know, you know, I think you're right on the, on the money, Jose Luis, uh, you know, institutions see their quote unquote reserves as that's the last thing we go to. Right. We can have the conversation about what percentage of the endowment can help us out if there's some kind of exigency because of a crisis moment. And it varies across institutions and not just by type, just by virtue of their fiscal stability. Right. But the first thing that institutions will go to is that, OK, how can I reduce spending that, you know, they, they almost have this instinctive kind of hierarchy of hurt. Right, you know that then um, where good institutions figure out that of course furloughing is is like the most hurtful. So, you know, but maybe uh, cutting faculty travel budgets isn't as hurtful, right? That kind of hierarchy of hurt for fiscal decisions, um, and you know the question about to what extent can institutions muster some you know, unexposed pocket of revenue. Typically, as what I see in, in other institutions, um, mine included, but in others as well, is how to figure out where else have we been, you know, accessing revenue, right? Continuing education, et cetera, in those markets, graduate parts of graduate education, the online market, right? Institutions, you know, as Lori said, now see the virtue in online spaces in a way that they hadn't before, or many do now in the way they hadn't before. So, you know, you're always trying to get that balance in, 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 in the books, right? Without first going to that, which really makes you feel financially stable, which is some measure of the endowment and what you quote unquote need as a reserve. So, yeah. No, that's, that's really helpful. I'm going to turn to Lori, but I, I'm reminded of a conversation we had in prepping for today, wherein we were talking about when someone comes to you and says, well, wait a minute, why can't you put in an in-kind GA for my grant next year of $25,000 right now? Why can't I go to this international conference in Europe? Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's like, well, because there's an explanation and it's not, you know, specifically about you. And yet it's also parallel, you know, getting people to understand what's real and the realities our campuses are facing while absolutely respecting their appropriate right to question, uh, question the, the decisions and the assumptions being made about, um, about, you know, how to use the limited resources that exist. So well, the last question we had, and we'll need to do this quickly, like in about a minute or so, was to just give people any message that you have who are ASH members who want to have a voice, either as researchers, um, maybe uh, within their own institution and in student affairs about decisions that are being made, whether to inform them or to voice how it affects them um, and get to academic leaders so that they can get that, those voices uh, into the conversation. So any, any words of wisdom there? Uh, Lori, please start us off. 
Um, I would say, you know, if, if uh, you're a member and you have access to research or scholarship um, that could inform decisions going on at your institution, send it, email it, like do that. I would appreciate receiving things that would help me um, in the decision making process. And I think the other piece is rather than me as the department chair or the leader having to keep saying things over and over again, I appreciate it when my colleagues help you know, to, to share that with those in their programs and people who really just really haven't tapped into the gravity of what's going on um, and are making these outlandish requests. Like it helps to not be the only one, you know, uh, sharing a message. So I think those are just two strategies. Thank you. Very helpful. Anna. Um, anticipate that the good changes to things like instruction and admissions and even move-in days, which were a breeze this year because everyone had to have an appointment um, that ha well, we've done this year are going to really require us to defend it, or defend those changes and promote those changes around equity, et cetera, um, across all the good things that we did. That don't, don't be fooled or sort of dulled by into, you know, sort of this crazy state of believing that, you know, change is now change forever. It's not. So you're going to have to work at it to make sure that it stays and sticks. Yeah, I was, I, I was just going to say, I think one of the silver linings of, of this virtual space is that getting people together um, is, is uh, facilitated. You know, we don't have to combat walking across campus or figuring out, finding a good location. And so I know at UD, a group of faculty and staff started something, it's a grassroots coalition called the UD Anti-Racism Initiative. And, and it's really to speak into how to center um, our work around black and brown students and faculty and staff and, and what would that look like at our institution. And, and I, I think it could have happened at a different time, but I think that the fact that you can name a time like 12 noon and a ton of people can just log in from where they are makes a huge difference. And so how, how do we use some of the tools we have in this virtual space to really promote coalition building to advance voice um, for, for, for those, those really key things that, that, that hopefully stick. Thank you. This has been a really thoughtful panel. And on that last point that you just mentioned, um, I want to point out that the virtual 2020 conference <laughs> is actually, because it's not in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, though we wish that it could be, um, you know, it, it could create opportunities for folks to be um, with us from all around the world that, that otherwise might not have been able to travel, that didn't want to put the footprint um, on the environment. Um, and in addition to that, um, Ash has made this huge commitment that any graduate student who's frozen out of their registration fees um, can, can just note that they're having, um, you know, that they have financial uh, challenge and we are going to get it covered so that our graduate students are taken care of by us, by our members. So um, I hope that you will, if you enjoyed this, come to the next webinars because boy, is there a fantastic group of um, scholars and, and leaders that are um, being facilitated by our colleagues and um, that you also register for the 2020 Ash Virtual Conference. Jason, and, and thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna clap for our panelists and thank our Ash office. Um, and I think we're ready to, uh, Jason, if there's anything else that you wanna add? Yeah, absolutely. I just want to thank Anna, Lori, Jose, Luis, and Carrie Ann, especially for moderating this and getting this series together. Uh, as Carrie Ann just said, we have five more webinars in this series, the next one being next Thursday, where we're going to talk about adapting to the state and federal higher education financial landscape and make COVID-19, so chatting a little bit more about state and federal policy. I also want to share that if you're joining us today and you're an academic leader, if you're in a program coordinator, department chair, dean, uh, VP position, and you, you want to create some community. Uh, we're hosting our first ever academic leaders workshop uh, on Thursday, December 3rd. Uh, so I know Jose Luis said to a question earlier, ask me a little bit later in the semester and we'll chat a little bit more. Uh, so this will be a great opportunity for those folks who are in academic leader um, leadership positions to kind of get together, uh, talk about the fall semester and uh, learn from each other and create a little bit of community. And with that, thank you all so much for joining us today and we hope to see you next week.